Okay, so on to part B, right? And this is just a continuation of where we, we left off in part A, so. We'll talk about this, right? We're still on the hemispheres, we're still on the cortex side. But we're, what we're gonna discuss now is the white matter And this is the area, in fact, where we're connecting the cerebral cortex to other areas of the cerebral cortex, other areas of the cerebral hemispheres, and other parts of the regions of the brain. This is that communication areas, if you will, that, that, we're, we're, that we're seeing here. Okay. White matter always means myelinated stuff, right? So we're myelinated axons here. And they're bundled together in what we call tracks, right? Tracks are a bundling, right? Bundle of axons that are myelinated. in the CNS, okay? Which we've talked about before, tracks. We used that word before. So what happens if uh, you have bundles of tracks of axons that are myelinated in the PNS? What would you call those? You would call those nerves. There's the two paired uh, terms, right? Does that make sense, right? You call those nerves, but inside the CNS, brain and spinal cord, you call those tracks, okay? So there's three main tracks, if you will, of this cerebral white matter. And they are put together depending on the location or the direction that they run, right? So there's an association track, commissural track, and projection track or fibers, okay? The association fibers run horizontal. They connect the different parts of the same hemisphere. So they're gonna find they're gonna be association fibers on the left, association fibers on the right. Commissure ones are the horizontal fibers that connect gray matter of two hemispheres. They connect left and right and right and left, okay? The projection actually connect, the vertical, they connect the hemispheres to the lower brain or the spinal cord. So they're the ones that connect the entire hemisphere to other parts of the brain. Okay, so we look at this, this figure is really a, a good figure to look at when you look at then, in fact, all of the tracks, right? So let's take a, take a look at the association ones, which are in pink, right? And they're connecting parts of the, of the hemisphere to other parts of the same hemisphere. So you can see those here, so I'll just draw some of them here. All right, there's some that go here, some that go here. There's some that are there, some that are there, some that are there, okay? And then there's some actually on this other side, right? These are the axon of a neuron that connect one to other neurons on the same hemisphere. That's association, right? What about Commensural, right? They connect between the hemisphere. You see them connecting left and right here. Okay, between the hemisphere. And then finally, we see the projection ones that connect hemisphere to other parts of the brain or even 
parts of the spinal cord, which go here. Okay. All right, so this is, these are just connections of neurons, but in fact, there's just the axons that are bundled together that connect brain to brain, brain areas, regions to regions, hemisphere to hemisphere, between both of them or with, in the same hemisphere. Again, this is the wiring, if you will. Okay, so what they've done is they cut it in side cut here, so you've seen the lateral side, you're seeing from one side, left side, let's say, to the inside of the brain, and you can see the tracks there, right? Hard to see in this brain right here, but if they drew them out for you like they do here, easier to see, right? You can see the associations there, the commissural, which you see just the edges, the axon cut like this, right? That's why you see it's in green dots, and then you see the projection fibers. both of which are the stratum. This is the putamen, it's the caudate nucleus there. So what are the, what's the basal nuclei's responsibility, right? They participate in muscle movement. They also participate in emotions and cognition, like the other ones we just talked about, multimodal, for example. Slow and stereotyped movements. Incorrect or inappropriate responses, they filter out. Unnecessary movements, they inhibit. So when you see disruptions, diseases, or disorders from this area, the basal nuclei, like Huntington's disease and Parkinson's, we think they're disorders of the basal nuclei. That's the what the research has been telling us so far. I and mean, there's been a lot of research, right? That when these neurons are misfiring or not wired correctly, or they're dying, then we start to see these things occurring. Does that make sense to you? And that's why in Parkinson's disease, you see this kind of, you know, this kind of thing, right? You see this kind of movement, if you will, or sometimes the neck moves in this way. It's because those are helping with those muscle movements. And if those neurons are not firing correctly, then this is what you see, okay? That's the basal nuclei, it's part of the cerebral cortex further in. And so when we look at this, right, all of this uh, pink and blue, if you will, um, represent areas deep inside the brain, but the pink area, in fact, is all the basal nuclei. Buddies up right next to the blue area, which is actually the ventricles which is also really close to the purple area, which is the thalamus, hypothalamus. That's another part of the brain. Thalamus, hypothalamus, and what we call the epithalamus. So let me circle those for you, right? The egg-shaped structure right there in the middle is the thalamus. The area right below Here is the hypothalamus, which does include as well this little outpouching, the pituitary gland, which is for hormones. That's a, a group of cells that secrete hormones or endocrine cells. And then this really small area right behind the th hypothalamus and 
hypothalamus and thalamus is this, this small area there called the epithalamus, where we hold the pineal gland. Okay, pituitary gland is kind of the director of the hormones. It secretes a lot of hormones. And in the epithalamus, the pineal gland secretes melatonin. Okay. So thalamus, egg-shaped. That egg shape is actually a, a bunch of nuclei, which are cell bodies, right? That's what we mean, bundle of cell bodies. That's the neuron cell body, right? Really big one. Makes the wall of the third ventricle. 80% of the diacephalon is the thalamus. And inside that nuclei, the egg shape, there's a bunch of subnuclei, so a bunch of little separate bundles of those cell bodies, right? So what do they do, right? All those nuclei that are the thalamus project and receive fibers from the cerebral cortex. This is what we mean. We look at the egg-shaped thalamus, and if we look at it here in figure 12.12a, .12 and we look inside, all of these colors represent collections of cell bodies that are kind of separate from the other ones. And that's all we're seeing, okay? I don't expect you to know any of this stuff here, but that's just to show you that it's actually a sub-collection of a bunch of cell bodies. What does the thalamus do? If it's kind of projecting and receiving information from the cerebral cortex through itself, it's a relay station. Relay station for information coming into the cortex. So where is this information coming from? The sensory parts of our body, right? Sensations. They're going up the spinal cord, through the spinal cord, and then those signals are carrying into the neurons of the thalamus, and the thalamus get, is getting that information and then sending, directing it where to go in the cerebral cortex. What part of, is this vision? Okay, it's back here. Is this hearing? It's right here. Is this, uh, you know, sensation of your hand? It's right here, wherever it's going. So the thalamus is kind of doing that. Sorts, edits, relay, the input, the sensation. Impulses from the hypothalamus, impulses from the cerebellum, the basal nuclei, import impulses for memory, sensory. Mediates or regulates sensation, motor activity, arousal of the cortex, learning, memory, all through the thalamus. Re big old relay station. What does the hypothalamus do? Again, it's part of the wall of the third ventricle. It has nuclei as well, bundles of cell bodies. One of them is called the mammal, uh, mammillary body. The mammillary body are nuclei that act as relay stations for scent, for the sense of smell. And we know that the pituitary gland, I just told you that, right, is connected to the hypothalamus. And we use this word infundibulum because it's the connection between the th hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. This is what we see inside of the hypothalamus, right? These little different colors here in the hypothalamus all just represent collections of cell bodies or nuclei in themselves, right? 
The infundibulum is the connection. It's right here. It's the infundibulum right there. Just a word we use to describe the connection between the hypothalamus and this down here, the pituitary gland. So if you look at the underside of the hypothalamus, you would see these kind of dense collection of tissue there, and that's called the mammillary body, and that is for reception for olfaction. Oops. Or the sense of smell. It's a, and is a major chief operating officer of homeostasis. It's the regulating center for it as well. Okay. This is important to understand because this is where we, we control the ANS, the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic service system is doing what? It's controlling or it's on autopilot. It's like the thermostat of the, the body. It's the one that's maintaining that controlling system, like temperature and blood pressure and heartbeat and all that stuff. Okay. Physical responses to emotions, right? This is part of the limbic system, right? This is where pleasure comes from. Fear, rage, biological rhythms, sex drive. This is part of their of the response, right? The hypothalamus. So again, as I mentioned, it's a control center, right? Along with the thalamus, it helps to regulate sleep-wake cycles. This is our biological clock. This is what you see here. Again, it controls the endocrine system because Connected to it is a pituitary gland, so it directs the pituitary gland when to secrete or when not to secrete hormones. Here's the last part of the hypothalamus. We call this the diacephalon. I'm sorry, the epithalamus, which is part of the diacephalon and the and forms part of the third ventricle, because all three of them form it. This is where we have the pineal gland, right? Pineal gland makes and secretes melatonin, which is a hormone that regulates the sleep wake cycle. Melatonin secretion varies depending on times of the day, right? So one of the things that's uh, going to dictate when the pineal gland is going to secrete or start secreting more and more melatonin is visible light. So when the sun sets, in fact, and you can override this as a person, but as the sun sets, normally speaking, Visible light will change in the eyes, and so the eyes will perceive that, send that information through the brain, and then will dictate that information to the pineal gland, and then you'll start secreting more melatonin. And as that melatonin increases in secretion, that makes you very sleepy, right, or getting tired. 
which is going to dictate then the body kind of shutting down or slowing down, right? And this is why it's kind of important to, after sunset, this is when you're going to get ready for bed, right? So you start with your, your task, right? Getting everybody ready for bed, yourself for bed, whatever you do to your routine to get ready for bed, but that's kind of how that starts. That's why you feel sleepy when the sun sets, for example. Now that can be overridden, so not everybody does that because you can actually override that stuff. Your sleep white cycle can change depending on whatever, work or whatever you are, but that's what normally will occur, right? Okay, so we've talked about all of this already. We've talked about this part already. So all of this is taken care of. All that is taken care of, right? The only thing we have left is to talk about that down here. All right. We still have the brainstem and that cerebellum, right? So that's kind of where we have left. We've already kind of discussed, at least touched on some of it, because we should be a lot more to talk about, but it's just we don't have time for a lot of it. That's kind of what we're seeing. Figures. I'll show you what. Okay. So since we're about ten minutes away from from being done, just go ahead and you'll need to kind of look at each one of those in the brainstem, what they're responsible for. Okay. Shows you what they're responsible for there, right? One of those. Let's go. We'll just. There's responsible. I'm going to do what it does. Detail there. What? I just want you to know the function, right? Function. And then it starts the cerebellum where it's located, what its major function is, or function, sorry. Where does it get its information from? That's where you see it, right? 